Good evening. <laughs> I'm going to start with a question. Do you know what the connection between Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos? Jeff Bezos is the founder of Amazon, and uh, he's a rather rich man. The answer is that they both have space projects. And uh, obviously, because I'm talking about space. So uh, there's another one as well, uh, Elon Musk. Uh, he's very well known, and if I put that in the question, then everyone will know the answer. But uh, Elon Musk is a very successful entrepreneur, and he has a space company called SpaceX, and they have been in the news almost every day. Uh, Jeff Bezos's company, uh, Blue Origin, is not in the news, but they're doing very big things in space, and he's spending up to a billion dollars a year on space. I can't compete with that. <laughs> so I'm proposing a, a poor man's space project. Uh, but it's British, and what's important is it gets Britain back into space. And that might seem that that's a fairly frivolous activity, but actually getting space, getting Britain into space is very important because we need engineers. And engineering has a very poor status in this, com in this country. Uh, people are saying, oh, I want the washing machine engineer to come out and fix my washing machine. That's not engineering. Engineering is designing rockets and building things that help grow the economy. So we need this, we need something in the UK. And the government has recognised that, and they're beginning to invest into space sports. But we need something developed in the UK for the UK to inspire the next generation. So I was going to talk a little bit about my background, how I got into this, and hopefully this will lead other engineers to follow my tracks. I'm not saying I'm a pioneer, but I want to give something back to the engineering profession. So I was born at the end of the 60s, uh, around the time when the, the Apollo moon landings were happening, and maybe that had some effect on me. I was born in a time when there was black and white TV, if any of you remember that. Mm -hmm. There was uh, three channels, and then there was channel four, and that was a big, big news. <laughs> now we've got hundreds of channels. There's been, um, there was no internet, there was no mobile phones, and so you can see how engineers have actually changed the world in a significant way. And it's been said that software is taking over the world but not really much has happened in space. It's the same old way to get there, and things haven't moved on. So I graduated, I left university, and I've always had an interest in space, and I got involved in amateur rockets. And one of the things I did was um, we had a, a team of people, we built a rocket, and we took it out to Nevada uh, in the US, to the Black Rock Desert, we went to a, an amateur rocketry event called Balls. So it's a, a rather male-dominated event. <laughs> so we, uh, we got the rocket launched, prepared, launched it, and uh, somebody said something that got me thinking, and that's got me thinking for a number of years since then. And that was, the highest this rocket's ever been is in the aircraft that brought it over. And so that got me thinking, well, why didn't you launch a rocket off an aircraft? And I, I'm, I'm not the first to think about that. Uh, there's a, a rocket there being launched from an aircraft. So that's a proven technique. It's called Pegasus, and it's off a, an old TriStar jet. So it gives you an idea that, that that's possible. There's nothing, nothing new in that. But what we... Um, so we, we, we got the, the rocket launched, and then I came back to the UK, and then I got thinking there's something I can do. Why, why has nobody else thought about that? And it was around this time, uh, in 2004, there was a competition to get suborbital space tourism started. And in the, the, the winner of this competition was uh, this airplane, this craft, if I can call it that. It's called Spaceship One, and the carrier airplane is called White Knight. And the reason it won was that so that the, the rules of the competition was that you had to carry the equivalent weight of three people up to 100 kilometers and then get them back down to Earth and then repeat the process two weeks later. And this one, it was, uh, 
designed by an aircraft designer called Bert Rutan, and uh, he is a legend in the industry. His, the reason why it's different and the reason why it won, as far as I can see, is by starting higher up and dropping the rocket, um, so the rocket is underneath the, the main uh, airplane, dropping the rocket off, you are reducing the drag, so that helps you to gain speed. So if you start from the ground, you've got to fight through the, the thick atmosphere to get up to altitude. And Bert Rutan, who is the designer of this, this craft, he worked out, or his team worked out, that you need two and a half times as much energy or power to get up to that altitude. So it was a big, in effect, you would have needed twice the size of a rocket motor, two and a half times the size of a rocket motor to get up to that altitude. So there's a few other benefits as well, that if you've seen a rocket launching from the ground, it's got to um, slowly get off the ground and you need to be precisely aiming the rocket um, so it, it doesn't steer into the ground. If you're dropping off an aircraft, you can avoid that. So that got me thinking a bit more. Well, okay, great, they've won this competition, they earned a lot of money for themselves, but what next? And since then, there's been no suborbital, there's been no space tourism flights. In fact, unfortunately, people have lost their lives trying to build up Virgin Galactic. So this was then brought on by, by Richard Branson and Virgin Galactic. And there's been lots of delays and all of this is happening in the US, none of it is happening in the UK. So this is another uh, larger, this is the largest airplane in the world, um, not including the hybrid air vehicle. But as you can see, compared to the people on the ground, this is, this is enormous. It's got six engines and it's just the biggest thing ever. And the idea is that you can put a rocket in the middle and then you can drop the rocket off. So even the, the big guys, the billionaires, have realized that there is an advantage of starting launching from higher up. What I want to do is the exact opposite of that. So this is a, an amateur-built uh, radio-controlled plane. They launch it from airfields around the country, grass to airstrips. Uh, this is rather bigger than normal um, radio controlled planes. The advantage of um, using an unmanned plane, a radio controlled plane, is that you, don't, you can keep people away from it. So there's nobody at risk. If you're dropping a rocket off that, there's nobody nearby, nobody's going to get hurt. And you can fly the plane out to sea, so you're, you're keeping away, you're, you're keeping the risks right down. You've also got the benefits, you don't need um, the flight, the cost of the flight is pretty low, you just need some fuel and somebody to go and fly it, and off you go. So this was the idea to take off from land, fly out to sea, uh, go up as in altitude as far as you can go, then you drop the rocket off, and then you fly the aircraft back down to where you came from, and you land it, and off you go. So I want to do the same sort of thing, but um, at a significantly smaller scale to keep the costs right down. So we've had a lot of help from the Welsh Government, and they found us a place to do a static test. So a static test is when you're developing a rocket, you've got to start by testing everything on the ground, and you do it at a static test site. So the place that we've got in Wales is in the middle of uh, two valleys. There's no way that anyone will get hurt. There's a secure sort of area. And they've also found us a place, the Snowdonia Aerospace Centre, where we can do test flights. We can start by doing just doing test flights, not, not, no rockets to start with. So we fly, practice everything, come back, land, then we put rockets on and we slowly build up. So we're keeping the, the spend right down. The engineering costs are very low, but nevertheless, we're getting something into the air. So without the help from the, the Welsh Government, we could not get a, a launch licence. There's a whole load of bureaucracy that would slow us down. <coughs> uh, one problem is that um, I haven't yet got permission from my wife to launch, <laughs> and I, I don't think the Welsh Government will help me on that. <laughs> 
So this is uh, the airstrip, and as you can see, you go down the airstrip, and then you come off the end, and you're flying over the sea already. I then came across another project. This is actually a NASA project, where they looked at the idea of putting a glider behind a tow plane. And the advantage of that is that you've got, in effect, you can split up the design. So you, you design the tow plane, which is a fairly off-the-shelf sort of device, and then you have the glider, and that's carrying the rocket. So that, that seemed a good idea. I developed it a little bit further. So this is a picture of someone with a uh, giant scale um, radio control plane. So you can see that people can make radio control planes of pretty large size, and it would be big enough to tow up a fairly substantial glider to go and drop a rocket off it. You can see with that plane that you could actually um, you could put a small child in there, but I, I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> if this is going on the internet, no, do not put a small child in that plane. <laughs> but it shows that it's all, it all seems possible. There's no reason why it couldn't be done, and yet nobody's done it yet. So this is a chance for Britain to do something a little bit different, but it's a good chance to do that. So we've done some simulation on what we think that the, how, how the rocket would fly up to altitude. So the way we were thinking is that we start, we, we drop the rocket off the aircraft at five kilometers altitude, which is actually not that high, so it's about half the altitude that a jet airliner would fly at. Uh, so it, it then launches, so it drops the rocket off, it will then fire the booster, and the booster will accelerate the rocket up to near the speed of sound, but keeping it below the speed of sound, so that's about the speed that a, an airliner flies at except the rocket will be flying vertically. And then it will drop off the booster. It then goes to a sustainer, which is another type of motor. And that does not have so much power, but it, the idea is it burns for a long time so that the rocket slowly climbs up to altitude. And then you go to the final stage, and this is roughly the size of the final stage. <coughs> so it's a fairly, you know, the, the whole thing could fit in a car or a, a small van. And the final stage will accelerate very quickly, up to twice the speed of sound, and then it will drift or it will cruise up to an altitude of 50 kilometers. And then the whole thing will come back down again, parachutes, and then it will land back, back on Earth. So that might not seem that great a, a achievement compared to some of the American um, launches, but the thing is it's done from the UK and then school children can see, they can get involved in a British project rather than seeing some distant American project. So I was going to finish off with um, thinking about what do school children really want to see. I was involved in a, an amateur satellite, it's called FunCube, as we talked about at the start, and this, has been, this satellite has been heard by many thousands of school children around the world. But I think that school children are not that interested in hearing satellites. It, it's great for a, a day out, but what they really want to see is go to a rocket launch. And that, that would really fire up their imagination, and that could lead us to the next generation of high-tech companies. Any questions? Mm -hmm.